Welcome to another Three Aficionados. That's uh, Sukasa walking us into the intro. Uh, you know who it is. We're talking about cars, watches, just an excuse to drink beer. With that, uh, today we're going to be talking about some new uh, drops of cars and watches that will never be attainable to even the richest of riches. Um, primarily the Ferrari J50 and the uh, new Patek uh, one of one uh, with uh, Tiffany signing that just makes everyone want to vomit and really hates uh, Patek lately. And with that, let's uh, stop dwelling and let's just enjoy this shit. And we'll pop it off. We got uh, Daniel sporting maybe something real or maybe just ginseng tea again. Oh, yeah. Three. Well, I just got my left going on here. Yeah, we're matching three. That's right. I was hoping that we might further up tonight. Yeah. Yeah, we can leave uh, leave Peter out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta find Lafa one day just for the voice for one of the one of the podcasts. We're gonna have to get them to sponsor us. There yeah. you go. <laughs> and we're we're doing a, a a shitty pour today. A little too much head. A little poor job. Yeah, a little too much head there, Peter. Well. <laughs> What are we, Peter? We already revealed what uh, Daniel and I are. are doing. What's what's that? It's just some, it's unfortunately a busy. Yes, the, that is all I had in the in the liquor cabinet at the house. So we are uh, we're rocking with it tonight. So uh, thanks to busy for the for the beverage. <laughs> oh <laughs> man, your sponsorship deal just kicked in, eh? Yeah, yeah. Well, we. <laughs> boatloads of busy now oh, that's amazing <laughs> you know i was at uh, tim hortons yesterday morning in the drive-thru oh, and on. the person in front of me paid for my coffee i thought they must recognize me this is <laughs> we're finally we must be blowing up they're like that's one of the aficionados that's oh man i can buy one i could buy a coffee say i got it for them that would be so cool so thanks <laughs> thanks guys well, cheers, boys, and uh, thanks to the random Tim Hortons person. Cheers. Cheers, everybody and lady. It was a lady? What a, what it a was a lady, yeah. Very nice. She was a nice Toyota 4Runner, too. Toyota oh, key. So, respect. Double <laughs> respect. Basically, Daniel's ideal woman. <laughs> great car, great taste in a coffee shop. That's all I need. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's do a, a wrist check. Daniel, what are you sporting in the dark web camera universe over there? I've got my uh, blacked out BMW uh, Copenhagen chronograph on today. The Cope. Felt like, uh, felt like wearing it, you know, Very nice. nice and light. So just an easy piece to wear. Feels and good, looks good with anything. And PD with his fancy uh, paneled walls behind him. Yeah, <laughs> I have the uh, Tudor on today. I, uh, I I bring it back whenever I come back to Calgary. So uh, yeah, I just uh, most of the time I would say it's on my wrist when I'm in Calgary, just because I don't like to leave it uh, in Lethbridge. So yeah, uh, it's beautiful with its bronzeness in all its glory. I love this watch. It's starting to. I don't know. It's, it, I feel like it looks like it gets aged sometimes. Like you can see like the patina slowly starting to set in and some of the, the, um, the oxid oxidization on the, um, the bronze, but I, I, I like it get either way. I don't think I would ever uh, change it. I think it's cool kind of that it's uh, changes color over time and it's still in good condition. I'd like to say, I mean, I beat it up a little bit. I wear it all the time. I've taken it swimming a few times. I don't know. I've lived with it. That's the point of it. Right. Enjoy it. So. Has it oxidized on you, especially in the pool? No, uh, you know, well, I've never worn it in the pool. I've actually worn it in the lake before, which is even sketchier. But uh, no, I, uh, it's never oxidized on me. Like I've never had uh, like blue left on my skin kind of thing. Like I've had it before with like plated gold stuff, but never with, um, with uh, the bronze. So I that was kind of it, it up to the point of using it so much that it has barnacles on it. I feel like it should be something that's really at sea there. Yeah, that'd be legendary. Yeah, that'd be that'd be pretty funny. I turned off the lights for a little uh, into glow. There we go. J got the G Shock, the John Mayer Hodinkee. 
uh, original version sporting today. I, uh, I decided to keep on wearing it. I was wearing it outside when I was uh, giving the final wash to the cars after putting them back to hibernation mode after, uh, you know, getting a schnook in and being able to take out the GT2 and drive the two and enjoy the weekend. It was uh, awesome to bring that thing out. It is a dangerous weapon. Seeing the uh, images of it out with the uh, snow all around on the side streets and on the lawns was pretty, uh, pretty amusing. Yeah. I basically decided about all my watches around driving that GT2. I was like, first day, I uh, got to go white Daytona. Second day, I was like, black Daytona. And then I was like, mm, later on in the day, better go Hulk. I feel like that thing is just such a monster. So, well, it's not actually the Hulk. This is the the Starbucks or the Sermit. Um, <laughs> the Hulk. So, there's absolutely no re rationale other than, you know, I guess... Starbucks, I slightly prefer to Tim Hortons for coffee. I'm not sure if that's blasphemy, but I don't think that Starbucks is that good either. It's not blasphemy, but it's a terrible nickname for a watch. It is awful. I, I prefer yeah. Starbucks. Yeah. Yeah. Starbucks way better. Pepsi is a cool name. What the, f what the fuck is Starbucks? Oh, yeah. I've, I've got a Starbucks. Cool. <laughs> so I think we were talking about... <laughs> the the width of the lugs and the the clasp here and it makes it feel like it's just so tightly wound around my wrist it makes me look even girthier so you know not often that i get to say that <laughs> hi -oh. it's, a it's a beautiful looking watch <laughs> the man makes the watch though the man makes the watch and so does the cuck <laughs> <laughs> so let's get into it uh how about we do some uh some watch news i'm gonna share my screen here we'll try to mute out uh, daniel's dark web shots here and uh so first up we're gonna talk about this random dude uh so a rich man billionaire owner of this one of one uh patek philippe uh with it being a 5740 uh, with a Tiffany signing and there's like a close-up shot that's been going around Instagram and it is gross. I don't know. It's, I think the color is just off on it. Um, it's so funny that, you know, the, it just makes the 5711 uh, Tiffany signed one look so much better. But I, I think that the blue is wrong. I don't know what's going on here. But I think that it's generally received a lot of hate because now everybody's just so tired of Patek doing these like unobtainable versions while they say that they're phasing out the 5711. Would you guys rock this? Would you sell your left nut and your right nut for this one? No, I agree with you. It looks like they've taken uh, some inspiration from your G-Shock and gone for a whole Indiglo dial. <laughs> yeah, actually, I think that it, it probably does match that, that G-Shock color there, doesn't it? You know, just off this image, at least, there's uh, something kind of grotesque about it. Not that it's grotesque in the G-Shock application, just to clarify. <laughs> and the glow is awesome. <laughs> this is one of those cases where I like something made, but, you know, that's a G-Shock more than I like Patek. Yeah, I mean, I'd happily take it if I could get it, but uh, it's it's kind of ridiculous that they've got all these one of ones popping up anyways we'll never have it we'll never see it and that's fine it's a bit of a moot point was what, what do you think uh, peter it's, it is, I don't know if it's just the coloration of this photo but it almost looks like a pukey greeny color like it's it's off to me like i just don't see the the tiffany pop like the the uh, other the other paddock has and or even the the rolex uh same like it just looks kind of off to me and i think maybe there's just too much going on the dial with all the uh the the date and uh the month and everything going on there in the moon phase but it just kind of i don't know it just looks strange to me like i would definitely i personally almost would rather take the other one the other version versus than this i think I agree. This almost looks so cartoony, especially with the, the hands and the markers. They just really stand out. It's just a clash of a lot of bad things. I think it's just there's some high level uh, watchmaking here, obviously, with the moon phase. 
and then there's like some low level with that color and with the with the the you know markers and the hands with the black outline i don't know i, so I don't, of course wear it any day if if i were offered it but uh it's just kind of ridiculous so it's a high level of watchmaking but it's another example where money doesn't buy taste definitely but that brings us to another level of money doesn't buy you taste and if you're one of the rarest uh, bespoke uh, owners of all the Ferraris, you might have been approached with a J50 opportunity. Um, this is like, I guess, supposed to look somewhat like the F50. And it's built off of the 488 Spider. Um, there's only 10 that are being built. I think it kind of looks good. Um, it's something in between, I'd say, an SF90 and and the and like the new entry level. Like, I just don't really like where the design is going aesthetically. But it's kind of cool. I, I, I'm not going to lie. When I saw it pop up on Instagram, I was like, oh, shit. Is that a, like a new like a F8 Tributo, you know, Pista or whatever, like top end? Um, but it's just like another one that I'll just never be able to get. Speaking of which, Peter and I will be going to the Ferrari revealing of the uh, Competizione uh, 812. Uh, that'll be very painful we get to go see that and then i get to go why can't i have that <laughs> <laughs> i don't know why they invite me to the shit i'll just be <laughs> about how i don't have it. but uh what do you guys think would you would you uh does this do anything for you or is it another example just like the patek where it's like yeah that's nice for 10 people if i if i could have one of these i i think i would i would i like it a lot I think that there's uh, you know, any excuse to do, do something cool. I think I'll take it. You know, like um, the rest of the car industry has become pretty boring. Um, cars have become increasingly more bland. They resemble themselves more and more. And, you know, Ferrari is more or less on the unattainable page anyways. So if there's another one out there that I can drool over online and potentially get the chance to go out in at some point later down the road, yeah, I'm all for them making it, you know. I think that uh, any chance that anytime Ferrari wants to make something, I, yeah, do it. What blows my mind is it it's got the same horsepower as the GT2 <laughs> and it would be so much more money. So it's got the the 488 uh, 3.9 liter twin turbo V8 that's been tuned up to 690 horsepower, and then it's a spider. So it just makes me go, well, you could probably get all of this in an F8 spider, right? Like it's not necessarily more dialed up. It's just like aesthetically a little bit different. The performance is tuned up a little bit more by 20 horsepower. Um, but yeah, I mean, it gets my nod, but it's just kind of weird that they only. Uh, are doing 10 examples for the Japanese market alone. There's, a, there's something kind of, uh, for the, fr the front end, maybe you'll uh, disagree with me, but there's something kind of like McLaren P90 about it, looking at it from the front. Yeah, it doesn't I think it's the inlets on the hood, but... Yeah. It doesn't remind me really of, of Ferrari. Like when you look at it, you'd be like, mm, what is it again? Like if you didn't see the badges, would you be able to make out that it is a Ferrari? I think maybe what it looks like is more like the Ferraris of the future, like the, the design language that Ferrari is using now in their newest line of cars coming out. Perhaps yeah. this would look more in line with not the Ferraris that we're used to seeing, but the Ferraris that, you know, will become more used to seeing. Peter, you're the young, young gun who loves all new crazy hypercars and Lamborghini STOs and everything. Does this, uh, does this take the mark? I mean, I think Ferrari is actually losing a footholding with your market, with the, the youthful people of the world. The price tag is the one thing that I just don't really like, doesn't like, I get it. Like I understand, like it's like they're limited, but like, just for me, like if I were to like see anything about this, that kind of like, just, just a push off. It's just like for what, like you're getting. And it's like, it's it's you know only uh 
I sorry, what was it, 20 horsepower, or something like that, more than the other one. And yeah, it's got like some upgraded body panels and stuff, but I just uh I kind of agree with you in saying that I think you could get more for your or not more, but similar to what this would be for like a cheaper option kind of thing in uh, that sense. I don't know, it just doesn't really do it for if it got handed to me, of course I would take it and enjoy it. But other than that, it's not what I would spend my three point six million dollars on if I had it. Yeah. Definitely not. Yeah, the crazy thing is the, that, I mean, it's the fact that you're one of 10, but the yeah. fact that you're paying that price, I mean, that's way more than an SF90. And then, you know, when this showed up on the internet, a lot of people called it like a baby SF90. So it's definitely like they took an SF90 front and merged it with a, like an F8 Spider, in my, in my opinion. The wheels are kind of nice. I think that they're straight out of like SF or uh, F. F8 kind of design. But let's get into uh, talking about our top car that we're expecting in 2022. Um, just kind of things that are rumored and haven't yet been announced. Um, we're going to chat a little bit about what we're anticipating in 2022. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it over to Peter because Peter's got something loaded up on his computer. And we have no idea what Daniel is actually doing on his computer because again it looks like a dark web. Let me see if it'll work here. You guys let me know if you can see my screen, please. No. No. But you can start talking about it. Um yeah, either way, um I'll start talking about it, but yeah, I think it's going to start. Um, I know we talked about it a couple times before, um, but uh, this is kind of just one of the things that I uh, kind of wanted to bring up is one of the things I think would be a cool anticipated. Uh, and this isn't specifically it, but it just kind of prompts uh, ideas of it, but Porsche's new hypercar. And uh, yeah, I think it'd be really interesting to see if something pops up in the next year. I feel like with the way everything's been going recently, it's probably going to be more like the next year, but uh yeah, this is uh, some prototype for photos of the Le Mans car that Porsche is supposedly making. And uh, yeah, it just looks pretty cool. looks pretty interesting. It sounds like they're trying to get back in the racing game. So it'd be interesting to see if they make uh, uh, a hypercar maybe that's rendered off of this in the future or something along the lines. But I guess we'll kind of have to see as to what uh, goes. But yeah, it's something I would look forward to at least. Yeah, I think that it really... It'd be interesting. I, every time I see the prototype show up, I wonder whether that will be, you know, the design language and whether that will serve to inform the future car, future supercar that they develop. But uh, they still are denying whether their supercar is actually coming or not. So we'll see. But yeah, Daniel, uh, you do you have a, a car that you're looking forward to in 2022? I have. Uh, well, I less specifically the one car um i'm more more interested in the new lineup of uh, mercedes c-class vehicles that have come out and are continuing to come out so it's been talked about a little bit this past while but it's not something that we've had a chance to talk about as of yet um so like the new mercedes c-class is incorporating a mild hybrid setup and they've released some new images of different interior options so you know i worked for bmw quite some time ago um, and mini cooper and i still love mini coopers but the newer bmws have started to become a little bit less interesting to me partly because the new mercedes are becoming more more interesting to me so what, um, what's exciting to me is, is that the new C-Glass lineup incorporates essentially exactly what I'm, I'm personally looking for as uh, what I think a modern driving enthusiast might be looking for, which, has, um, which involves a setup that could be either rear or all-wheel drive, depending on where you live, what kind of conditions you might need to drive in but then to have the ability to have a vehicle where you can drive around in either electric mode or hybrid mode and take advantage of fuel savings, you know, especially as the cost of fuel continues to just 
you go up and up and up. Um, the idea of my much beloved V8s, <laughs> you know, they become less and less convenient um, every time you visit the pump. So if you have the opportunity to mate, you know, uh, and mate a hybrid system where that you've optimized it, not necessarily for um, <laughs> efficiency alone, but to assist with a smaller engine and then allow you to take advantage of perhaps electric on short trips, save fuel, and then, you know, pump it into sport mode or uh, pop it into sport mode and, uh, you know, maybe get a chance to hear some of the exhaust and really fly around. Yeah, so the, there's some. Yeah, the, this announcement, of, especially with the C63 going hybrid, immediately made me go, should I be buying the last of the C63s that are hybrid? Um, you know, it's kind of funny to think, you know, uh, it, we're, we're looking at it from totally different vantage points. You're like excited for the future. And I'm like, oh, I'm an old fucking dinosaur. Give me the old shit that burns the fuel. Um, I'm like, maybe I should stockpile this because it's just like, you know, the last of the naturally aspirated V8s with the Ferrari uh, 458 or, you know, the last of the manual uh, naturally aspirated uh, GT Porsche cars with the 4.0 RS. I just wonder what this will do. Like, I feel like the C old C63s are gonna go up in value. And I wonder how amazing the performance is gonna be. Uh, I, I'm open to it. Certainly they're, they're definitely putting their money where their mouth is. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what they do. Peter? Yeah. What's your youthful view on everything? Is it, is, um, is it good to move in this direction for the future? Or should we just be old dinosaurs like me? I don't like the all electric. I think like Daniel's point about like hybrid and like putting it into when you want to is cool kind of thing. But I could not, I couldn't drive. Like you would never catch. Well, I don't know. I, I, I don't think you, I honestly don't think you'd catch. You'd never catch me having just an electric car. Let me say that. Maybe I'd have like an electric car with something else, but I'd never just have, because I love like getting behind the wheel and like listening to that engine and all that stuff. Like I could just, there's you, there's something about like you're saying when you want to throw it in the sport mode and hear that exhaust, you can, but if you want to save the gas money. So, but I, I don't think the all electric phase is kind of like, kind of odd because what if you're going someplace and then it's just like there's no like you know power is not always an option if you're going camping or whatever right so i just see sometimes it's uh maybe i guess you're not taking your tesla to the mountains but who knows you know what what killed it for me with the uh concept of driving electric cars for the sake of a true you know, full body experience was killed for me when I saw Tiff Needle talk about going racing in the Tesla race series where they strip out you know, the Teslas. They leave the drivetrain essentially stock, but they managed to lose 500 kilograms of weight. And he was talking about how incredibly fast it is, but there's absolutely no sensation within the driving seat. There's no vibrations. There's no wind noise. You can't really hear or understand what's happening in the environment outside. And to me, that is basically the same thing as like, you know, being in a spaceship, which I think for some people is very cool. But for me, the whole idea about driving is emotional relationship between what I'm doing, you know, the inputs, that I'm feeding to the vehicle, the noises and the sounds that the vehicle makes. And it's not just about all out speed. It's about a whole lot more than just straight line speed. So, you know, I think that a hybrid system really is a good way into the future. I do also already have a Mercedes V8 and I love it. So I'm not seeking to, you know, add necessarily something of like kind to the garage already i'd be wanting something more new and with the times you know all right let's go back to the old dinosaur i'm going to share my screen because i'm going to basically fly exactly in your face the complete opposite of what you're saying 
<laughs> of what I'm looking forward to. Uh, so I'm going to jump into mine. And uh, this would be what you'd expect from me. Of course, the 992 <laughs> rs is what I'm looking forward to the most, probably in the real world. But just to piss off Daniel, I pulled up the other thing that is also something that I'm super <laughs> excited to, to learn about, the M4 BMW CSL. Just because Daniel says that he doesn't like BMW, I thought that I'd pull up a BMW that I'm looking forward to. And I think that the M4 CSL is pretty cool. I mean, the last CSL M3, that was an amazing car, other than having an SMG transmission, and now they're flying up in value. Um, just to think of that as an E46 M3 CSL successor nowadays, uh, I think it, it could be pretty cool and promising. But again, it's a BMW. Sometimes BMW really misses the mark in a lot of ways, um, but it's supposed to be a monster. And if it's manual and rear wheel drive, then you got my vote. It's, it's apparently turning the wick up to like 560 horsepower with its, uh, its turbo uh, six, so, um, or 550 horsepower there. And they're supposed to be losing weight anywhere between 150 to 220 pounds. And to me, at least with these camouflage shots, it, it seems promising. Um, maybe they might actually be breaking up that massive kidney grill. That would be amazing. And they've got new race bucket seats that are looking super substantial. And they've got like CSL marking in the back with a rear seat delete. So I think that's kind of cool. I know we've beaten the horse to death about the 992 GT3 RS that I'm really excited about. So I'm not going to go into so, so much detail, but this was one that I took a deep dive into when I saw some, some of the camo shots uh, popping up and the, the new rumored uh, seats and interior. Would this com convert you back to BMW, Daniel? Or am I full of shit? So to get a I have a very, very deep love for BMW. It's a, it's a complex relationship, you know, <laughs> like with a sibling. I've owned a couple of them. I I really do enjoy driving BMWs. They're a unique driving experience. You know, BMW helped forge our relationship. And I have great memories with basically more or less every BMW that I've had the pleasure of driving. For those who so, don't know, BMW sponsored Tinder that day when Daniel and I met. <laughs> I was the best uh, BMW grinder date I'd ever been on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. So, yeah, let's see what happens. I, I think mean, I, I really can't deal with the front end on the new 3 Series. I just, I'm so glad that the other cars don't have such a ugly fucking face. It's so you know, ugly. Like, it is just hideous. So I, I can't get into it. I really want to get past it. You know, it's like, I want to forgive a girlfriend for something really fucking terrible that they did, but I just keep stumbling. <laughs> like, oh, that, like, why would you, why would you do that? I was just listening to the smoking tire discussion with uh, Matt Farah and Jason Camisa talking about the M4 and how much they ha hate it, um, especially the manual. Um, and they were talking about like how they just randomly shuffle people around people who have no idea what's going on on that project. And then like, they'll take the design person randomly drop them in. And the di design person is like, well, how do I make my mark? And then they're like, oh, Dodge charger. And so they like made this thing look like a fucking Dodge charger. But, uh, and then the other thing that they were shitting on about was, uh, the manual transmission. Apparently with the, uh, dual clutch, it's like way better compared to the, the manual, like they said, the manual is quite shit in this. So that makes me go, I, I'm, I'm not fully in, but would I put a deposit, a small deposit down to see if this thing turns out to be as interesting as I think it potentially could be? I mean, just think about that, just from a bird's eye view, we're talking 560 horsepower, and we're talking rear wheel drive and we're talking manual transmission this day and age. That's kind of insane, especially in a BMW M package that's lightened up. That's the race version as close as an M car is going to get to a race version of CSL. So 
I think it'd be cool. We'll see. Hopefully it's not just a random badging and, you know, a rear seat delete, but I have a feeling that they might actually deliver the goods on this because they did do that on the M2 CS in retrospect, although it was like super overpriced, but this makes me wonder like how expensive is the M4 CSL going to be? Same thing with the, uh, what, the M5 CS, right? That's the yeah. one that won the Motor Trend Car of the Year and everyone is kind of talking about how amazing it is you know it's what 50 percent more expensive than a regular m5 but people talk about how you know price is not really the big deal there the real deal is how amazing the car is so could bmw do it again with this car you know like i'm hoping that they manage to take what's supposed to be already an incredible card that looks terrible and make an even better card that still looks terrible well hopefully they can fix the grill i sent you like a, a random i think cj wilson had uh posted up uh sort of a mock-up image of how the kidney grill could be fixed and maybe perhaps it'll be fixed in the the csl but i i think that very minor adjustments could be made and here in this camo seems like there's a bar going behind the euro license plate so we'll see i don't know i feel like they this made looks it like a backwoods buck tooth missing tooth <laughs> squirrel or something like what is going this is a, this is some kind of chipmunk that's had a bunch of moonshine you know like what has happened to that face <laughs> Hold on, see that Man, they get bigger every year. I don't understand. Oh, so that's the like, worst gap tooth so, smile I've ever yeah, seen. The, the beaver forgets to shave its teeth down kind of thing, and they just keep beaver, growing. Beaver, yeah. Well, I don't know why. Yeah, beaver's, beaver's the animal. Get on my choice. <laughs> All right, well, I'll stick with the 992 <laughs> <laughs> Good call. I told you a whole love story. You know, the, the GT3 RS, it... It, it, and the GT3 whole platform, I really still have troubles with that front fascia, like that fish mouth still uh, kind of makes me go, the last generation looked so good compared to this. If you just could take everything on the new 992 GT3 RS and throw the old bumper on, it would look so good. And, you know, I've taken millions of shots of the GT2 RS out on the road. And I still look at the front of it and I'm watching the front of it and I'm like, this looks so good, especially yeah. in, in that volcano gray paint to sample. So yeah, I mean, this is still a cool car. I mean, it's just nuts, but yeah. One other thing I want to talk about uh, is uh, an interesting discussion and this often comes up and it's not necessarily coercive or pressure tactics, but you know, often times when you ask for like a desirable watch from a, a watch shop they might ask you you know are you interested in anything else and and so i feel like you know from a loyalty perspective um from my main dealer like i i've thought you know what else outside of rolex and tudor should it be i and obviously i'm always open to potential omegas and i still wonder if i should have gotten that bond watch way back then but um it started to make me look outside of the brand and it, more and more I've seen Cartier really coming up and Cartier has been super hot. And like, I think it's largely pushed by celebrities, um, especially with like the crash um, and being sold at such a high auction price. And, uh, and so it started making me look at like, what is their flagship? Obviously it's always the tank and the Santos that seems to stand out as like the entry level kind of three series of, of the brand. And I never was a big kind of square kind of or rectangle kind of guy like the JLC uh, Reverso or the tank, you know, I wasn't so sure, but then it, it got me looking deeper into the Santos de Cartier. And I, the more I looked at this, I realized this is actually sort of in line with an AP Royal Oak or a Patek uh, 5711 like Nautilus where you've got the integrated bracelet on the Santos de Cartier um, and you've got the, the riveted uh, uh, drilled uh, screws there, not riveted, but uh, the drilled screw, uh, screws there. Um, so I, I think it's kind of hitting a sweet spot with the no date on the medium, 
and it's obviously a lot more formal and smaller um, than than all of those other wristwatches. You could get in large, but large has the date function. But the more I looked at this, the more I went, yeah, I actually could really see myself wearing this. And I think that that's probably just because I've been wearing a lot more smaller watches lately, like the Explorer 1 or the Datejust 36. Um, so this one comes in around uh, 35, I believe, but it's got the square face and then it's, it's and, and the whole way it kind of works with the integrated bracelet is pretty cool. It has like a quick release where you can remove the, the bracelet and switch it over to the leather strap that's also included. It's got an in-house uh, automatic movement um, and it just speaks to me. I mean, it's, it's not one that I would necessarily have noticed if I weren't encouraged to do so, but I'm like, hmm, well, if you do want to get me a, a meteorite dial a Daytona or, you know, or maybe a Tiffany OP so that I can just uh, ruin uh, Peter's life uh, and, and I'll get one of these Santos, uh, I'd be pretty tempted. And I actually mentioned it to the dealer and the dealer was like, yeah, you know, that's pretty in high demand. We don't even have that either. So it's crazy that the market has moved so rapidly to the point where you can't even get a Cartier where they'd always sit under the glass. What do you guys think? Is this like too much of a, a formal watch? Like I'm not usually a formal watch, but I feel like this is a striking a balance of like it's sporty still. And it's got some of those vibes of like seventies kind of um, AP Royal Oak and uh, Nautilus uh, look. Yeah, I like RJ. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been a fan of uh, the brand pretty much most of my life. I think that they fill that niche for me of a more formal watch that can also be potentially dressed down to a more semi-formal watch as well. But they they make a beautiful, timeless piece that you could wear and pass down for generations. You know, um, this is actually probably my preferred a watch that Cartier makes and it it also falls into the category of being one of those models that could be worn by anyone of any gender so you know I think that that kind of watch is also appealing in a lot of ways you know I've had people ask me about watches for women and there are people who want unisex watches or more feminine watches or perhaps more masculine watches. And then there's brands like Cartier that seem to basically tick the box all across the board where anyone could wear that watch and it would look great. That's it with the uh, calf strap on it. And um, I totally agree. And also because of the, um, the, the system that doesn't actually require tools, I believe. <coughs> but they provide a tool there. Are you okay there, Daniel? You just aspirate some of your beer? The lefa sometimes doesn't go so well in the lungs. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Cheers. Daniel, our, uh, our primary guy Down. in the house. Um, yeah, I think that the nice thing is that you can ex exchange and uh, you can also take out the links very easily. Um, so the whole system is quite, quite cool. It's pretty cutting edge. And I really love the blued hands. Um, I'd want it in the steel, not with like the bicolor with the gold around the bezel. Um, I think that it, it it's really nice the way that, uh, you know, the the bezel actually integrates and drags down into the the bracelet. Before, uh, before 2018, the old model was just a square bezel and it didn't have this tapering into those, those links in the bracelet. Now it just kind of melts into it really similarly to what you come to expect on a, a Nautilus or an, a Royal Oak. I mean, I think that it would be kind of a cool watch that fills a gap that's not currently in my collection. It's also not in crazy price point. So I'm kind of like of the mindset, if I do get a crazy killer watch that is offered to me, that's kind of like, a, well, it would be nice if you got something else. I feel like this one would be great or, um, or the Grand Seiko SBGW 231 that we've talked about. So there might be a double watch in the future. We'll see. I think it'd be kind of cool. Of the two, which would you take? 
I mean, they're different price points because I think this, this is American 6,800. Um, but, you know, basically we're talking a few grand more for this compared to the Grand Seiko SPGW 231. Personally, I see myself now after doing all this research, I, I really see this watch very promising. And like, I think that it would be a forever watch that will take off and will be impossible to get in the future. And it will become something like a Nautilus or a Royal Oak because it just has all of those primary check boxes ticked off. And the more and more people are appreciating Cartier, the, the more I think that it's, it's gonna get hot, but it's never gone up into that price bracket. The other, other two are interestingly. So what do you think, Cartier or Grand Seiko, if you had to choose the two? for more form Cartier. Yeah. Yeah, I like, uh, I personally, like I've looked into Cartier in the past and I uh, I like the uh, Santos. I'm also a big fan of the tank as well. Uh, personally for me, I if I could choose any of them, I probably would go with the tank. But uh, yeah, I do really like the blue, uh, the blue hands and then the blue, uh, the blue, it looks like, is it blue? No, no I think it's just the, the blue hand. But yeah. Are, are, uh... Black. Black. Yeah, um, but it, it's got a touch of blue in there. I think it looks pretty. And uh, yeah, I would personally probably take it over the Grand Seiko as well. But I would actually probably say I would take the tank. Personally, it's the one that I've looked into uh, a bit more than the Santos. Yeah, the probably more appealing to you would be the large Santos that's in, you can get it in a blue dial or a white dial. I like the white dial in this with the way the numerals stand out, you know, just for the purpose of a more formal watch. Um, but the blue, I feel like would, would definitely suit you, Peter. But yeah, it's all pipe dreams. We'll see what happens next month, but that's a possibility. I think it's, it would be a cool watch to have, but it's not one that I'm gonna be asking, you know, special favors about. Um, so yeah, well, boys, it's a nice and uh, short and brief talk of how we're going to ring in 2022 anticipating you know shitting on each other's cars daniel with the mercedes peter with the uh porsche supercar or just joining le mans maybe you could be a le mans race car driver and then me, my undecided 992 gt3 rs versus just shitting on daniel's uh anti bmw talk with the m4 csl what, what we've learned tonight, what we've learned today, is is that BMW, mm -hmm. Mercedes, Porsche, and Ferrari all suck. Yeah, garbage. <laughs> they can all. Why would you want one? Well, we all know that basically all I'm getting <laughs> from here on out is Toyota. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm I'm a lover of all all cars that are, you know, uh, going back to the basic recipe and sticking to more analog and visceral, uh, purposeful cars. So. I mean, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have the cars that I have and I look forward to the future cars. I think we're right on the cusp of where cars are, you know, there's still some really great cars that are coming down the pipeline and it's not all, you know, dark in the future. So you just sometimes have to pull your head out of the weeds and remember that it's not all Tesla. And sorry to the Tesla fanboys. Now I've shit on everyone else. We've gotten rid of anti, we've gotten rid of the anti-vaxxers and we've gotten rid, rid of the Tesla fanboys. But um, yeah, whatever. So uh, <laughs> this is a reminder that all of my opinions are my own and not that of you know my employer, because uh, <laughs> I'm actually an employed physician or not. So yeah. So tomorrow, I have it actually marked in my calendar. Do I call up the BMW dealer and ask to be put on the, the wait list for the M4 CSL? I mean, it's not a full commitment. It's just like I am for the Z06. I'm like number 67 for a Z06 Corvette. Um, is there any harm to adding my name down with like a small deposit for an M4 CSL? And then, you know, if it does look shitty, then I pull it, of course. But I, I feel like it's pretty promising, you know? Give it a shot. See what happens. Yeah. Might as well. Screw it. And should we stockpile uh, uh, Mercedes C63s? Old thing. <laughs> you guys do that. I'm going to wait for the next generation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the future is bright for Daniel and it's, it's pretty uh, dark and, um, you know, 
unpromising for me. Pretty I, I, dark and dingy future for the doctor. Dark and dingy for the doctor. I, <laughs> <laughs> my old cars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm pretty fortunate. I, I've got all the good old stuff. I, I, it's crazy to think about all the permutations of things that could happen in the future. Should I get, you know, a GT4 RS, a 992 GT3 RS? Should I get a GR Corolla? Should I get, like, and that's just the new stuff. Then there's, like, old stuff. Should I get a 997 GT3 RS back? I've still been begging my friend who bought mine for mine back. Um, or should I, you know, aim to try to get um, a Ford GT? You know what they say, you can't say, no. too busy saying, yeah. You, you broke up there, so nobody knows what you just said. Are you serious? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All we heard is, the, yeah. The we end. just heard yeah. dark webs. Uh, I never so say weird. anything twice. I'm well, done. Well, anybody who's listening, you can just go ahead and delete this episode, because clearly we have nothing good to say or our connections are shit. So <laughs> Daniel will not be heard a second time. So that's it. That's right. I'll get fucked. I'm just gonna sit here and rotate my sweet ass bezel here. You go you go and enjoy your crunchy self. That's right. Crunchy. Crunchy <laughs> luxurious with my Starbucks. No, not Starbucks. Starbucks the evil column. No the new sexuality or <laughs> curious. What? You're crunch curious, yeah. I'm crunch curious. Yeah, well, I'm not touching that. I think I've I've burned enough bridges in this episode. So yeah, that's pretty good. I think I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. All right, we'll see you on the dark web tomorrow. Thanks again, guys. All right. Good All luck. Right. Peace out. Peace. Have a good night.